I'm back with part two of our discussion of young adult literature, and we're ready to jump into the 20th century. In fact, the early 20th century brought innovation, artistry, and even mass markets to children's literature in general. Such authors as Beatrix Potter, Edith Nesbitt, J.M. Barry, author of Peter Pan, just to name a few. This was also the golden age of children's illustration, with such illustrators as Arthur Rackham from England with his beautifully illustrated and haunting collections of fairy tales, children's classics, and even American folk tales. And of course, the American L. Frank Baum and the wonderful Wizard of Oz, which was a truly innovative and unique American fantasy for children. Personally, the Golden Age is my favorite period of children's literature, and two recent contemporary novels for adults deal with this period, The Forgotten Garden and A.S. Byatt's novel, A Children's Book. Both of these novels are written for adults, but they explore the Golden Age of children's literature at the turn of the last century. But notice here that I said children's literature, not young adult literature. That's because, with rare exception, Anne of Green Gables being one, there weren't many books for the audience we now consider young adult. The reason? Until the 20th century, adolescence as a stage of life was not formally recognized. Individuals passed from a short childhood into an early adulthood without the marginal in-between space called adolescence. Despite the growing awareness since the mid-1860s of that distinct state between being a child and being an adult, American psychology itself didn't recognize this state of being until 1904 with the publication of a book by G. Stanley Hall, Adolescence, Its Psychology. Novelist Natalie Babbitt goes even further. The category teenager itself is a new one, of course, it made its first appearance during the Second World War and was created partly by parents, partly by manufacturers, and partly by Frank Sinatra. As we discussed in part one of this class, several developments in children's publishing took place in the early 20th century. The development of serial books, first for boys, then for girls. Stronger, less sentimental fictional heroines, and a range of emerging genres, fantasy, mystery, historical fiction, even science fiction. Much of this culminated in Nancy Drew in 1930. She was, after all, a teenager, 16, independent, resourceful. She drove her own roadster and knew how to change its tires. She was fearless, welcomed adventure, and was distinctly unsentimental. But despite her popularity, Nancy Drew and the entire category of series books were in the 1920s and 1930s by and large regarded as trash. And there still wasn't a formal category recognizing adolescent readers. Books for children were designated as juvenile fiction or junior books. But in the mid-1930s, when Laura Ingalls Wilder began work on the final books in her series, all of that was about to change. When Laura Ingalls Wilder began the fifth book in her series, By the Shores of Silver Lake, her daughter, author Rose Wilder Lane, encouraged her mother to switch main characters from Laura to Carrie, because Rose felt there wasn't a market for books about teenage girls and their more mature concerns. Laura, who would be 13 in this book, was too old to appeal to juveniles, Rose contended. Fortunately, Laura Ingalls Wilder disagreed. We can't spoil the story by making it childish. We can't change heroines in the middle of the stream and use Carrie in the place of Laura. Furthermore, Wilder believed that an older character, a 13-year-old, should struggle with more mature themes. I don't see how we can spare what you call the adult stuff for that makes the story. It was there, and Laura knew it and understood it. And Wilder believed her readers wanted this kind of novel. 
I believe children who have read the other books will demand this one and they will understand and love it. Wilder stuck to her guns and in many ways blazed a new trail for American authors who were slowly crossing into uncharted territory, the young adult novel. And Wilder continued to maintain that adult themes were important in her remaining books, even when her editor at Harper's, the legendary Ursula Nordstrom, urged her to remove this scene from her last book, Mrs. Brewster and the Butcher Knife. In 1943, when These Happy Golden Years was published, this was a very daring, dark, and unconventional scene for young readers. From the late 1930s into the 1940s and 1950s, a wealth of books began to emerge that specifically targeted teenage readers. But it wasn't until 1958 that the American Library Association finally adopted the title that we all know and have come to associate with books for teens, Young Adult Fiction, a full 90 years after the publication of Little Women. So how do you define young adult literature? The American Library Association defines its audience as readers between the ages of 12 and 18, or if you accept this definition, middle school and high school readers. But if you read critical scholarship on what's called YA literature, you'll find terms like these, books for teens, teenage readers, adolescents, are these terms interchangeable? And if they are, are these delineations between books for young readers always clear? The answer, as we saw in part one for middle grade novels, is yes and no. Some critics even object to the term adolescent. It has the ugly ring of pimples and puberty, or it suggests immature in a derogatory sense. Young readers develop at different ages. More importantly, however, is the question of readership. So some 10-year-olds are reading Philip Pullman's The Golden Compass, while some 14-year-olds can't make it through Charlotte's Web. To complicate matters even more, publishers are themselves very arbitrary when it comes to the YA category. When my young adult titles came out in hardcover, they were targeted for readers 12 and up. By the time those same titles came out in paperback, the reading level had dropped to ages 10 and up. This issue cuts to the heart of the matter. What's the difference between a YA and middle grade novel? Is there an overlap between the two? I took an informal poll a few years ago among the writers I work with most often, authors in my critique group, and here are some of their answers. While I don't claim to know exactly what differentiates YA from mid-grade, other than age of protagonists, complex or mature themes, etc., but I too have had the experience of having a hardback say one thing, 10 and up, and a paperback say another, 8 to 12. Jane Yolen once said to me that a paperback marketed for 8 to 12 will do better than one marketed for 10 and up. So in this case, it's strictly a marketing decision. Tis a mystery to all. Try as I might, I can't seem to get classified as a middle reader writer. I'm always YA, and I want to be middle. I should follow up with Graham because he's now considered primarily a middle grade writer. He worked hard to get this status, and I'm not exactly sure how he achieved it. Maybe by the end of the class, I'll have some answers for you on this one. I don't think there is a hard and fast rule. I go by the age of the main character. If he or she is a teenager, especially over 15, I'd say YA. If the character is younger, especially under 12, I'd say middle grade. Another rule of thumb. If it's full of sex, violence, depressing situations, and ends unhappily, then it's definitely YA. Then Eric had another thought. I've been thinking about middle grade and YA. Another hint is to look at the cover. If the kids look like they're high school, whether they're in school or not, then it's YA. If they look like middle schoolers or younger, then it's probably middle grade. On the other hand, the cover often has nothing to do with the book. 
but at least you know who the marketers are targeting. And there's more. But determining the complexity or mature situations is so subjective that it probably depends on what the editor decides or where the PR people think it will sell. If anyone comes up with a concrete answer, I'd love to read it. And finally, this from the late Dorothy Morrison, who wrote for both young readers and adults. You've raised quite a question, and I can't begin to solve it. The little biographies I wrote for elementary, upper elementary kids are being read mostly by adults. The only thing I know is that there's a huge difference in interest and abilities in kids. If you or any of us figures it out, I'd like to know. Dorothy's situation was especially intriguing. In this quotation, she refers to her little biographies. They were very short but well-researched books for middle grade readers on historical characters from the Pacific Northwest. And this was her final book, Outpost, John McLaughlin and the Far Northwest, a serious, academic, well-researched biography of this important pioneer in the Pacific Northwest. It was written for adults. But the very first year Outpost was published, she heard from an eighth grade teacher in New England who had assigned this book as required reading to his eighth grade students. Dorothy thought all along Outpost was an adult book, and yet to her surprise, her meticulously researched academic biography crossed over to YA, while her middle grade histories, very brief and simply written, were being read by adults. Even the American Library Association itself doesn't seem to know the difference between middle grade and young adult fiction. Witness House of the Scorpion. In 2003, the American Library Association named it a Newbery Honor Book, and as we discussed in part one of this class, Newbery Awards recognize outstanding titles for middle grade readers. But the ALA that same year also named House of the Scorpion as a Michael L. Prince Honor Book in 2003, an award recognizing outstanding YA titles. So one book, two awards for two different categories granted by the same organization. So clearly there's a great deal of confusion about the differences and distinctions between middle grade and young adult fiction. Still, the comments we've seen from Northwest authors on the issue hint at a series of indicators which set YA books apart. The age of the protagonist, more mature themes, sex and violence, unhappy endings. I want to come back to this in a minute in more detail. In the meantime, here's a textbook explanation of the differences between YA and middle grade fiction. A comparison of E.B. White's beloved Charlotte's Web and Robert Newton Pack's A Day No Pigs Would Die illustrates one of the differences between children's and adolescent literature. In White's classic children's book, a beloved but useless pig wins a ribbon at the county fair and is allowed to live a long and happy life, whereas in Pack's young adult book, a beloved but useless pig wins a ribbon at the county fair but must be slaughtered anyway. Nevertheless, rather than being devastated by the death of the pig, readers identify with the boy and take pride in his ability to do what has to be done. This kind of change and growth is the most common theme appearing in young adult literature. On the surface, this kind of analysis makes sense. But for those of you who have read Charlotte's Web, you'll probably recognize its inherent fallacy. Certainly a pig, Wilbur, is the main character in Charlotte's Web, but is he really just a pig? No, he's really a child. And in many ways, Wilbur is the reader, or at least he's the character that readers identify with. He's not simply important to the main character, he is the main character. And what happens to Wilbur? 
Like the main character in Peck's book, Wilbur loses a beloved creature. He loses his best friend, Charlotte. Hearing this, Wilbur threw himself down in an agony of pain and sorrow. Great sobs racked his body. He heaved and grunted with desolation. Charlotte, he moaned, Charlotte, my true friend. Come now, let's not make a scene, said the spider. Be quiet, Wilbur, stop thrashing about. But I can't stand it, shouted Wilbur. I won't leave you here to, alone to die. If you're going to stay here, I shall stay too. Don't be ridiculous, said Charlotte. Wilbur was in a panic. He raced round and round the pen. Suddenly, he had an idea. He thought of the egg sack and the 514 spiders that would hatch in the spring. If Charlotte herself was unable to go home to the barn, at least he must take her children along. Now, it seems to me that Wilbur exhibits just what Nelson and Donaldson admire in Peck's YA book. You could certainly say that readers identify with Wilbur and take pride in his ability to do what has to be done. And in fact, when Charlotte's web ends, readers sense a new maturity in Wilbur. He has grown and changed, which of course is the most common theme of young adult literature. Wilbur never forgot Charlotte. Although he loved her children and grandchildren dearly, none of the new spiders ever quite took her place in his heart. She was in a class by herself. It is not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Charlotte was both. So where does that leave us? Here's a middle grade book that clearly exhibits change and growth in its main character. It also deals with a very serious subject, death. So is Charlotte's Web a middle grade novel because its main characters are animals? Could it be that animals can't and shouldn't appear as characters in young adult fiction? But in Philip Pullman's The Golden Compass and the remaining books in the series, his main characters can morph into animal beings and a polar bear figures as a central secondary character. Yet this book and the rest of the series are clearly YA. The fantasy is a retelling of Paradise Lost. The series is also embraced by adult readers. So animals as central characters in middle grade, but not YA fiction, hmm, that's clearly not the difference. Could it be, as this author contends, that I am coming more and more to the conclusion that adolescent literature is whatever any adolescent happens to be reading at any given time. Could be. Yet there are indeed characteristics that apply to young adult fiction. And these characteristics seem to resonate with readers who are 12 to 18 years old, sometimes older. We'll take up this list in the next lecture.